Thank you, graduates. Thank you, Naveen, for this honor. Congratulations, moms and dads and grandmas and grandpas for doing the wonderful thing in this difficult world of raising decent people in an indecent world. My comments today are really directed toward the future teachers that are in front of us. And I know this is a, a challenge that I embrace full-heartedly, the most difficult kind of speaking engagement, the commencement address. It's comparable, for those of you who read your Shakespeare, to the first scene in Hamlet, where Laertes is the young guy who's going on a trip, and his dad, Polonius, is trying to give him some advice uh, in a long fashion. And Laertes is getting impatient, come on, I gotta go, I gotta go, and Polonius is giving the various versions of advice, neither a bower nor a lender be. Uh, if you're going to be in a, in a fight, uh, try not to get in a fight, but if you're in one, re kick major ass if you can. Uh, uh, well, that's not exactly how it was written, but that's what, what it means. So I'm Polonius, uh, trying to give you uh, one more thing, one more thing before you go out, and you're like, come on, I'm hungry, I gotta go, gotta go, gotta go. So I will go and go. Um, if you haven't figured it out now, yes, there is crying and teaching, unlike what Tom Hanks said about baseball. There is crying in the, uh, the skinned knee and the uh, sad three-year-old and the fifth grader. There's crying in the faculty lounge and in the car. Tears of frustration, tears of bitterness, tears of joy, and actually tears of hilarious laughter. For there is no kind of uh, comedy funnier than that which goes on in the classroom. I think you should consider yourselves, graduates, a new breed of first responders. You are the ones who are going to rush in there and help keep the children that will be entrusted to your care from, well, I think you should think of it this way. The quality of the teaching that you will do is truly, for those students, a matter of life and death. A difference between a kind of life and a kind of death. The studies that have been shown that three consecutive years of ineffective teaching consigns a student subjected to that ineffective teaching to an educational deficit from which that child never recovers. And generations upon generations of children have been so dealt that kind of difficult hand. And you are going to be the ones who will make it different. You see, the enemy that you face as you're in the classroom isn't certainly your students, not their parents, but there's a kind of force that exists just outside the classroom that continues to draw away seductively your students. For if you aren't as good as you should be, that force increases in its power. That force that gives, if some are relent to it, a kind of master's level business acumen. That force that could give those who are drawn to it in the netherworld a kind of brotherhood, a kind of familial bond that may not exist in the home, in the world of the gang and in the drug land. Were you not good enough in the classroom, that nether force can draw to it access to bling and to respect and to the kinds of things seemingly prevented from children in circumstances because of the oppressor culture. So, again, with a Tom Hanks reference, in that thing you do, Tom Hanks is a, an agent for a, a, a group in the kind of 60s Beatlish era, and before they go out on stage, um, he says something to them that I think that you should say to yourself every day before you go into the teacher world when he says to them, it's important that you don't suck today. <laughs> I know that you look in the mirror each day and say, uh, I'm going to do well. You're not going to say, today I'm going to harm children. Today I'm going to be awful in teaching. Today I am going to be, no, no one says that, but yet it happens. How does that happen? How do you be good at this that you wish to do? 
You're also going to find very quickly that moment when you discover for all the good that National Lewis has presented in you, you're going to find a moment where something is going to happen that you were never prepared for. In my first year of teaching is when a student collapsed at an epileptic seizure. And I had, in front of my sophomores, I had no idea what to do. And so I did everything wrong. I dismissed my 22 other sophomores. Brilliant idea. And I am in front of this spasmodic child thinking, I should pick her up and take her somewhere. You say that, well, where were you 41 years ago where you could have helped me? An angel from the future. Don't pick her up, Tom, that's a bad idea. <laughs> so after a couple of these, a colleague, wondering why there were 22 sophomores gleefully skipping around the high school, looked into the room, saw the circumstances, oh dear, pressed the button, button, what button? A voice comes, who's this? Bring the nurse. I, I, I did not have the page in the teacher book when they said, when your student collapses in an epileptic seizure, this is what you do. Maybe it won't be that kind of dire circumstance. Maybe it might be that universal incident that stops all teaching and learning. When the bee flies in the classroom. O oh, sacred bee, follow we must thy trajectory. <laughs> the famous Michelle Ree, former superintendent of DC schools, when she was a Teach for America person in East Baltimore and the bee flew into her room, perhaps you've heard of this story. She was trying to get their attention, the bee was blocking that. So, oh heavens, and she killed the bee and ate it in front of them. Yes, the title of her, of her uh, memoirs is The Bee Eater. <laughs> and so you think to yourself, is that what I have to do to get attention? <laughs> Dr. Magahi, does it time to change what's on the diploma? <laughs> I, I don't, I don't want to eat bees. <laughs> what do you do if a fight breaks out in your classroom? Ah, simple, run. Of course, that's what your heart says, but uh, I don't remember uh, in my teaching experience and my preparation, Dr. Uh, Professor Goodhead saying, now, when the fight breaks out in your classroom, you move to the, lesser aggress to the more aggressive person, because that's the person you're trying to neutralize. <laughs> what? Uh -huh. Now, I'm not going to say that when you start your classes, there are going to be bees flying in hives and people dropping in epileptic seizures and fights breaking out from both corners of the classroom, but the point is, Will you be ready? You discover in this business that you teach who you are as you teach what you teach. It's not that your life is the subject of what you teach, but you give students two major things, a body of knowledge or the access to that body of knowledge, but equally as important, a manner by which that knowledge is held. Think back on the great teachers you've had in your life, and I swear that you will not be able to remember their great uh, lesson, lecture, test. You remember their essence. She was kind to me. Another clue from the vast uh, presumed knowledge of my experience. Students enter your classroom with a kind of a switch in their head, default set to nice. And they don't move that switch unless they get an indication from you that you don't know what you're doing up there. Students have no ability or no language for the argot of education, but they know when you don't know what you're doing up there. The example, think back in high school. Remember when you were in high school and the substitute teacher entered the room? And you kind of looked at each other, nice as you are, look how sweet and beautiful and guileless you all are, but at that moment you looked at each other and kind of an unseen, unheard thing came through you all, yes. <laughs> We can mess with this one. <laughs> and so, ironically, the switch in the child's mind that switches to naughty only occurs when you give them permission to, because you don't know what you're doing up there. Have you ever been in classrooms where you see uh, teachers put up the rules of the classroom? 
usually all negatives and usually all about what students can't do. No talking, no screaming, no running, no dreaming, no considering, no arguing. Never anything that teacher promises to do. I suggest when you have your students walk into the classroom that there should be a sign in your classrooms that say, I will not give up on any one of you. Students entering into that contractual circumstance might say, hmm, <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> students will say, maybe this is the one that will get me. Maybe this is the one I've been looking for. Many young teachers want to walk into the classroom wishing to give love to their students. They're full of love, they love young people, and uh, boy, are they going to find out some uh, students are not... Uh, it's just that it's a different kind of... Fun. Yeah, love is funny. Love is uh, mistakable. Um, I would suggest you give a child love, and when you part, as you are now all in the business of saying goodbye every year, for the rest of your career in a kind of a quick play that goes like this. Hi, come on in, it's gonna be great. Oh, look at all you've done, it's great. Oh, it's June, goodbye. Hi, come on in, oh, it's gonna be great. Oh, look at all you've learned, it's the end. Oh, goodbye, do that for 35 times and try not to be, uh, come on in, God bless it. <laughs> Yeah, I know you're smart. Okay, get out of here. <laughs> Love is temporal, and it leaves when you leave. Rather than try giving them love, give them hope. Hope follows. Hope grows. A hope that their tomorrows are going to be better. The mistakes that you're going to do in the classroom, and you're going to do them all, they're the ones you're going to remember, though you'll have thousands of successes and you'll have students who love you and call you by the name and do anything that you want to do, but you're not going to be defined by those students. Your teaching will be defined by the ones who don't get you, who don't like you, who give you that moment where you just want to say those words, you know that you got them, and if you, you just like, it would feel so good to just blast them into salt with the words that you have, but you, but you hold on. <laughs> you hold on. The first time I saw my student named Skip, you know, imagine the high school classroom with all the heads bobbing up and down. When I first saw Skip, I saw his feet because he was walking on his hands down the hallway. High school junior, popular, funny, aimless. And because of that popularity, because of his football prowess, he was uh, voted student council president, which I directed at the time. I had Skip all my junior year with him and into the beginning of senior year and with him every day, and trying to talk, enact, help, direct, all the kinds of things you hope to do. Oh, Mr. B, it's fine, he was a, I live for fun, he said. I know this, I, but, but you, look how many people follow you. I, so when he shot himself on Valentine's Day in 1979, and brought our high school into a paroxysm of guilt and sadness, the eyes were on me. Didn't you notice anything? Said my colleagues and the principal and the police. You must have noticed something. I didn't notice a thing. Not a thing. At his wake, his mom came up to me and said, I wanted to thank you for all you've done for Skip. Thank me. If I knew what, if I saw, we wouldn't be here. I have taught over 5,000 students. I think about Skip every day. What did I miss? And so, exalted as it seems to be I am up here with these very knowledgeable people, I'll say to you, future teachers, I failed Skip. But the favor you can do for me is 
you save him for me, okay? Because... <laughs> because I believe he returns. He's the fourth grader dying to find some adult who could talk about the horror that is in that child's home. It could be the 11th grader who wants to find someone who will say what in essence is, I, I think I'm gay, will you still like me if I am? That the 7th grader who will say, Mr. Ms., could I give you a couple of, could you have a couple of moments and you think it's gonna be about subject verb agreement or the great moment in the, the great Gatsby, but something entirely different. He returns, and I hope that you'll be able to see what I haven't. Ricky Lee Jones was a great songwriter in the 80s, the Duchess of Cool, and then, as the usual rock and roll story, had years of addiction and sadness, depression, and returned in the early 2000s with an album of quite different called The Evening of My Best Day. The title song of that album is, I think, a teacher's song, and some lyrics to give to you, that which you could give to the students, that which you can give to yourself. It's a song about bullying. It's a song about the effort, the effect of bullying. Um, and it seems to be that the voice in the song is someone who's trying to assuage and point out that the future's going to be better. It starts out, they all smile, they shake your hand, they want to know your name, while you sit in your mother's room and look through her window pane. And when they know you're not watching, they talk behind your back and they laugh at you, at your loneliness, at your awkward attack. But the calming voice of the teacher comes on later on in the song. Someday, many years from here, where no one else can see, you'll dig up those things they buried and finally set them free. Finally set them free. And it's a good life from now on when I look back at you. A good life. Look ahead. Your sky is almost blue. You are in the business of pointing out the blue skies of young people. And in that way, you will find a blue sky for yourself thereby. And I dedicate all that I said today to my mother, who passed away yesterday morning, though deep in dementia, I'm confident that she remembers everything and loves me still. Thank you all.